So today, we're jumping into the world present in the human body to look at some cellular biology, specifically the bloodstream and all of the cells present that keep us healthy. Hello everybody and welcome to the Science Of, where today we're going to be looking at the 2018 anime Cells at Work, based off of the 2015 manga of the same name created by Akane Shimizu. Cells at Work takes place in a human body and explores how the body's natural defense system takes on invading pathogens, including bacteria, viruses and more, over the course of its two animated series and many spin-off manga. Now of course, this is a huge subject to cover, so there's an important question, how should I cover it? Should I look at the series episode by episode and cover the cells and their abilities in each episode? Well, that could be good, but it'd be hard to get a comprehensive look at each type of cell. Instead, what I'm going to do is break it down and look at the different cells present in the bloodstream, looking at how they're represented in the show, and a bit of the cellular processes that occur when a pathogen or injury occurs. Now of course, this is a huge topic as there are 14 personified cells to take a look at, and I won't be able to cover it sufficiently in a single video, so this is going to take 3 to 4 videos in order to cover them all without rushing. This week, we'll be taking a look at red blood cells, platelets, and finish off by looking at mast cells. Next time, we'll be looking at how the body takes on primary infections by pathogens, including a wide variety of white blood cells. Then, we'll look at the body's secondary line of defense, including copious numbers of T and B cells, and if you'd like, I'll do an extra video looking at the different pathogens that invade the body and seeing how they compare to their real life counterparts. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to say if you enjoy this video, then don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to keep up to date on the latest videos and to make sure that you see the rest of the science of cells at work. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at our first cell line. So, we begin by looking at the most common cell in the human body, red blood cells, otherwise known as erythrocytes. These make up over 80% of cells in the body and have a crucial role in maintaining oxygen levels for every cell by transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide between these cells and the lungs. In cells at work, this is shown by the red blood cells acting as a worldwide delivery system, delivering packages marked with either red O2 or blue CO2 to cells all around the body. An ideal representation of these cells, and that's not all. They're able to do this thanks to their simple structure. You see, the red blood cell is made up of a cell membrane and hemoglobin. Naturally, the cell membrane contains a lot of lipids and proteins, many of which are used for recognition by other cells, and I covered this all the way back in my first video, which you can see here. Red blood cells have no nucleus, so they can have as much space for hemoglobin as possible. You can see this a bit in the red blood cells design in the show, with their hat shaped like a typical red blood cell, having a biconcave structure. Hemoglobin is a quaternary structured protein and is responsible for the red blood cell's ability to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body. A quaternary structured protein is a protein made up of four polypeptide chains that are linked together to form a singular protein. The oxygen molecules bind to the heme groups on the protein. The act of oxygen binding to the heme group increases the affinity of the remaining heme groups for oxygen by changing the shape of the protein subunits that make up the molecule. This is known as cooperative binding and means that they're more likely to pick up additional oxygen. What you may be wondering is, if additional oxygen increases its ability to bind to the heme groups, then how is it delivered? Well, the percentage of oxygen bound to hemoglobin is related to the partial pressure of oxygen at a given site. When the red blood cells reach a tissue that's using up oxygen, the oxygen will dissociate from the heme group thanks to its lower partial pressure resulting in oxygen being delivered to where it's needed most. This is where the cooperative binding becomes really useful. As the oxygen leaves the molecule, its affinity for oxygen decreases, meaning that it won't take up any of the oxygen from an area where it's needed. There are several details in cells at work that replicate aspects of the body, such as red and blue pathways that represent the arteries and the veins respectively. In the body, arteries carry blood away from the heart and is oxygenated, which gives it its red hue, whereas blood taken from the veins is blue due to its lack of oxygen. These vein pathways also have ticket barriers like those you'd find in a subway station to stop red blood cells going the wrong way. 
In human bodies, these would be valves formed by elastic tissue. These are present in the veins as the blood tends to have a lower blood pressure after travelling through the capillaries. The valve's function is to stop the blood from moving the wrong way around the system. That's pretty much all you need to know for red blood cells, but this isn't the only small biological detail in the background, and we'll cover more of these as we explore more cells throughout the series. Next up, we'll take a look at the smallest cell in the bloodstream. Platelets, otherwise known as thrombocytes, are only 2 to 3 micrometers in diameter, and they're so small they're technically not even true cells, but cell fragments. But for the purpose of this segment, I'm going to keep it simple and call them cells. They're formed from a hematopoietic lineage from what is known as a megakaryocyte. As the megakaryocyte grow and develop into giant cells, they undergo the process of fragmentation and then release up to a thousand platelets. Platelets, owing to their small size, only contain structures that are used to stop bleeding. In other words, they have surface proteins that help them bind to each other and stick to the surfaces of the blood vessels. This ability allows them to form firm plugs that seal any breakages in veins or arteries. To help platelets perform their functions, they also contain many proteins that allow them to change their shape, increasing their surface area by forming long filaments, which lets them reach out to contact other cells to form a net-like seal. In the show, platelets are fittingly depicted as child-sized cells who go around in large groups, fixing roads that cells use to get around the body, as well as helping save larger wounds. These adorable fragments, in addition to being the smallest blood cell, are also the lightest, meaning that they get pushed to the walls of blood vessels. This means that they're in place to react first to any injuries that break the endothelium. They do this through a process called hemostasis. This is the process that prevents blood loss and takes place in two steps. Primary hemostasis, otherwise known as the platelet response, involves the aggregation of platelets at the site of injury. Platelets have many receptors on their cell membrane that are involved in adhesive interactions, and these receptors are targeted by many different adhesive proteins. This leads to what is known as platelet aggregation, the clumping together of platelets in the damaged area to form a plug that stops further blood loss. Now, although this isn't shown directly in cells at work, they do mention the protein GP1B. This is a platelet surface receptor which binds the VF factor present in the wall of blood vessels during primary hemostasis. Following primary hemostasis, the coagulation cascade occurs. Effectively, this is a cascade of enzymatic reactions that result in the conversion of fibrogen to fibrin. These fibrin monomers are then cross-linked into insoluble strands that stabilise the loose platelet plug formed in primary hemostasis. We see this in the episode focused on scrape wounds, but kind of the opposite way round. With the platelets forming a wide net of fibrin which covers the length of the wound, and then covering up with large cells to form a thrombus. And rather than the plug being formed of platelets as you'd expect, they push large coagulated masses of red blood cells to form up the plug. But this isn't scientifically inaccurate. All this suggests is that the damage was in a vein rather than an artery. You see, venous thrombi are composed of fibrin and red blood cells, rather than an arterial thrombi, which is composed largely of aggregated platelets. Even in their first appearance in the first episode, there's a nice biological easter egg, with the platelets being unable to work because they can't unload some calcium ions. These calcium ions are essential for platelet activation in hemostasis, so it makes a lot of sense that they wouldn't be able to work unless they're unpacked. So the last cell we'll be looking at today are mast cells. These are long-lived tissue residential cells with an important role in many inflammatory settings, such as defending against parasitic infection and in allergic reactions. These cells mediate inflammatory responses such as hypersensitivity and allergic reactions by storing a wide range of chemical mediates such as histamine, interleukins, proteoglycans such as heparin, and various enzymes. The episode on allergic reactions illustrates the back and forth between mast cells and B cells, and this is a great representation of the way these cells react in the body. We see mast cells as responsible for the release of histamine in the show, but releases too much. Histamine causes blood vessels to expand and results in a lot of typical symptoms associated with allergic reactions. Swelling, itchy skin, 
a buildup of mucus in airways. In the show, this happens because B cells use too high a volume of the immunoglobulin E antibody when dealing with allergen infections. This is an accurate representation of the way that B cells influence mast cells, as mast cells are best known for their immunoglobulin mediated allergic reactions. In these reactions, immunoglobulin antibodies bind to the mast cells by several of their antigens and other receptors that are expressed on the mast cell's surface. The binding of the immunoglobulin to these sensitizes the mast cells to release the mediators in response to further encounters with that specific antigen or cross reactive antigens. And it's not just histamine that mast cells release, but also procrastaglandin D2-PGD2, which regulates sleep and pain responses in the DP receptors, and human necrosis factor, otherwise known as TNF, which plays an important role in cell survival, proliferation, differentiation, and death. TFN specifically has a large impact on allergic reactions in the lungs. When the level of histamines gets too high, then we see these allergic reactions referred to as an emergency immune system. Sneezing, nasal congestion, watering eyes, all through the lens of a worldwide catastrophe. Every episode of Cells at Work has some kind of action-packed climax, and the allergic reaction episode is no different, ending with an adrenocortical hormone android being released to suppress the immune system, histamines and allergic reactions attacking all manner of immune cells. Definitely an interesting take on a steroid medicine. So there we go. We've taken a look at just a small portion of cells in your bloodstream which deal with invading pathogens. But I'm nowhere done with cells at work. Next video we're going to start looking at the science behind the body's first line of defence as we look at white blood cells. And after that we'll be focusing on the science of T and B cells. If you want a bonus video on the different pathogens that invade the body, then tell me in the comments down below. And of course, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And to combat the ever-changing and frustrating YouTube algorithm, make sure you share the video to help my channel grow. If you have any particular scientific subject or topic you'd like to see me cover in the future, then please tell me in the comments down below. Or if you'd rather, send me a message directly on Twitter. Cells at Work has a ton of biological references and accuracies over the course of its seasons, and I can't wait to cover them all. But until next time, this has been the science of cells at work. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you're looking for some video game based content, then you can join me over on Toggle Jam Plays, where every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday, I show off a different game. Or if you want to support the channel even further, you can contribute to my Patreon, where you'll get behind the scenes access to the creation of all videos, as well as being able to vote on what the next science of video will be.